Um, and so that'll, um, we're glad to support them. There's a little bit more about them on their table. Without anything further, I'm going to let you get going. Okay. So, um, okay. Sure right. So we're good. The video's on and the sound is working hopefully for everyone. Okay. This is kind of awkward. I don't know how our pastors do this in <laughs> a workshop. Um, all right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm really glad that you chose to spend some time this evening talking about the intersection between race and um, the criminal justice system. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of who I am and how I came to this work. Um, so I grew up in uh, a single parent household, the oldest of four children. Um, I guess, and I did know at the time, and and I see even more clearly in retrospect that you know we were we were poor. Um, we I grew up. Uh, sometimes not necessarily knowing whether we had the money for groceries or the meals that would be on the table. And I started working at age 11 as a paper carrier to really, you know, contribute as much as I could to the household income and to help my mom as much as I could, especially as the oldest of four. Um, as you know, is kind of the case for families that grow up in that kind of situation. Um, all three of my siblings and I struggled with lots of different issues. My brothers much more than my sister and I at that time. Um, one of my brothers uh, had regular involvement in the juvenile justice system with multiple uh, late night phone calls to come and pick him up from the, the city jail. Um, and he really struggled at a very early age with addiction that led to all kinds of, you know, bad choices, bad behaviors. Um, and he had um, a lawyer in town who took on the cause of helping him and my mom as a single mother navigate the court system and navigate the process in a way that would minimize the, you know, the, the damage that he was trying pretty mightily to do to his own future. And um, that lawyer, along with a judge who saw in him something, something redeeming, something um, that warranted second chances and third chances and fourth chances. Um, and, and they were able together uh, to make decisions, to open doors or, you know, that would allow my brother to have, um, now, I'm trying to think how old he is, over 25 years of sobriety um, and all of the opportunity that his, his potential uh, should, should deserve. So I wanted to be um, a lawyer mainly because I, one, I babysat for a lawyer and, and lawyers do you know, at least generally make pretty good money. And I definitely wanted a better, you know, situation than what I grew up in. Um, but also because I could see that lawyers have a position of power, a position of authority in the community um, that allows them to access resources, to um, access people. Uh, and, and to really help those who otherwise are cut off or maybe don't have access to the same opportunities and resources. Um, so I became a lawyer. I started working as a public defender, um, representing people who are too poor to hire an attorney. And, you know, almost all of my clients were not just poor, but also people of color, mostly African-American, some Latin American. And, you know, I had really believed that I had gone off to school on scholarship because of my hard work in school, my industriousness, my effort, and, and that um, I had overcome, you know, the circumstances of growing up poor 
by, you know, the old saying, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and off I went. But as I started to have these interactions with my clients, hundreds of people who live here in Charlotte, it became really clear to me that they faced obstacles and barriers that I never did. That they faced obstacles and barriers in education and employment and housing um, that I just never had to confront. And that, you know, there were times along the way that maybe because of things I can't control, um, that maybe I was even given the benefit of the doubt so that I could pull myself up by my bootstraps and pursue the life that I really wanted to create for myself. Um, so that's how I came to this work. And, and I would say that one of the things that I have come to understand both, um, not just through, you know, obviously my regular interactions with people in our community who come in contact with the court system, not just through the criminal justice side, but also through, I've spent 12 years in juvenile court working in child welfare cases and uh, juvenile justice cases. Um, for a lot of people in our community, the deck is stacked against them. And I have a responsibility to not only recognize ways that the courts operate or are even sometimes designed to operate, to hold some people back, to make it harder for some people to move forward. And I have a, res and I have a responsibility to break down those barriers because I can't be complicit in a system that harms people. So we're gonna talk about the intersection between race and the criminal justice system. Um, so uh, I told you a little bit about myself. Um, we're gonna talk about some, some history of the, the role of the law in uh, race. Uh, we're gonna talk about the science of mental shortcuts or heuristics. We're gonna talk about racial bias in the criminal justice system, the role of discretion, and some of the things that we're doing locally to try to address these outcomes. So we've already talked about who I am. So, you know, we like to think of the courts as a, a deliberative um, institution that establishes rules and practices and policies that ensure that everyone, no matter who they are or how they come in touch with the court system, gets a fair shake. Um, Chief Justice, Chief, former Chief Justice. Justice. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. Uh, former Chief Justice uh, of the North Carolina Supreme Court, Mark Martin, uh, commissioned a report on um, the administration of law and justice in North Carolina and um, formed a commission. This commission conducted interviews and surveys of citizens across the state, of lawyers and judges and practitioners across the state. And one of the things that the report found was that the vast majority of people of color who, have, who are citizens of our state or who formally work in our system view the courts as generally racially biased and producing biased outcomes. A smaller percentage of white uh, citizens and members of the system uh, express that view. But one of the things that the, the, commit, the task force recommended and that Chief Justice Martin articulated in his report is that if we're to fulfill our constitutional mandate to administer justice without favor, denial, or delay, we have to be really intentional about understanding why people of color have that experience. And we have to be intentional about creating the atmosphere where everyone um, experiences a bias-free court. Um, following Chief Justice Martin, former uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice Sherry Beasley went a little further in acknowledging the existence of institutional uh, practices and policies 
that harm disproportionately people of color and that judges should be trained to recognize their own biases, that we have to be experts, not just in the law, but in equity and equality, that we have to recognize some difficult truths of our past and legacy lives on currently in our justice system. So let's talk about some of those difficult truths about our shared past. Um, I'm, I think even non-lawyers are relatively familiar with the case of Dred Scott versus Stanford. This is a decision that essentially found that the Constitution was not meant to include American citizen, citizenship for Black people regardless of their status of being freed or slaved. The courts played an integral role in creating a distinction between the status of people of color and whites. Now, we know that uh, also after the Civil War, several amendments were passed to try to address this issue. So I think one of the questions that we'll talk about today is what impact have these amendments had on our countries and our court's perception of race? So the 13th Amendment abolished slavery and involuntary servitude except for those convicted of a crime. There's a legacy and a constitutional justification uh, for putting people who are convicted of crime to work. In Plessy versus Ferguson, um, which is another case many lay people are familiar with, the Supreme Court uh, in this post-Reconstruction case was decided as Black Codes and Jim Crow were advanced by state legislatures and upheld by state courts, mostly across the American South and here in North Carolina. Ultimately, the ruling was that the 14th Amendment established, quote, legal equality of white and Black Americans, but did not and could not require the elimination also other distinctions based upon color. Justice Harlan, in his dissent, wrote that the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among its citizens. Now, we know that we've come a long way through the civil rights um, cause for eliminating separate but equal and trying to create opportunity in education. Um, I won't talk very much about Korematsu versus United States, but this is a case where essentially the Supreme Court held that an American citizen of Japanese descent could be forced into an internment camp in California because of the military's justification that it was necessary for the national defense. Can you imagine if, if members of Congress or an American president today argued that Iran people of Iranian, Saudi Arabian, Afghanistan descent go into some special residency setting into an internment camp in order to protect the national defense. But this is the history of our court and developing legal justifications for the separation of race. Now you're familiar with Brown versus Board of Education. Um, I think one thing that is interesting about the history of this case is that Chief Justice Warren, who was the Chief Justice of the court at the time this decision was made, prior to hearing the case traveled to India in 1950. The first question he was asked when he arrived was long did America tolerate the lynching of its movement? He later wrote that he realized that the complicity of the court in justifying Jim Crow and justifying tactics of terror to uphold racial separation affected our international relations around the world. Smartphone connected. In fact, President Eisenhower in a 1954 address to the American Bar Association actually said the American system 
is on trial in the international sphere. And the extent to which our legal system and government action reflect the spirit of our Bill of Rights, the spirit that all persons are, are, are created equal, will contribute more to our national defense and our national security than stockpiling weapons. In fact, when the Justice Department filed a friend of the court brief in this case, the Justice Department spent in that brief talking about the for national security than as a cause for social justice. So we see a series of cases, including Loving versus Virginia, which is a case in which the court ultimately upheld, well, struck down a Virginia law that made interracial marriage illegal. And we start to see this progress in the courts, right, through the 50s and 60s, through the actions of organized legal challenges to laws that arose during the period of Jim Crow to perpetuate a separation of whites from blacks after slavery. Um, in fact, in North Carolina, at one point, we had a law that allowed uh, defendants to challenge excessive punishment sentences if they could show that the, that the punishment was motivated by or um, advanced by the race. So the North Carolina Constitution, you know, talks about the, the equality and rights of persons, that everyone is entitled to life, liberty, and fruits of their own administered without favor. Really come. You know, I grew up uh, like my husband. We grew up in the 80s and 90s. That's when we came of age. That was the time of colorblindness, right? I don't see race. We all grew up, we, we grew up in integrated schools. Eric was among the first to be um, to be uh, integrated. Uh, here in Mecklenburg County. His brother Lou was the first class uh, to experience busing and to be bused from Cotswold over to West Charlotte High School. We grew up in a time of colorblindness. If we could all just forget the past and just see each other and not see each other's color or race, then everything was gonna be fine. That's the time we grew up in. How has that worked out? Is justice really blind? Can it be blind to race? So what do you think? Is justice colorblind? Now, what, um, 50 years after Brown versus Board of Education? You're saying no? Why do you think not? Mm -hmm. Repeat. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so one, um, we heard that prison sentencing. Uh, shows that justice is not blind. Yeah. It's okay. Sorry. Okay. If you have money, good lawyers, good connections, mm -hmm. and your wife, it's going to be benefit.
So let's talk about that. So some of the feedback uh, for those who are participating by Zoom is that people who have money are going to have better outcomes. People who have resources and connections are going to have better outcomes. And people who are white are probably going to have better outcomes. So did you want to say something? Right, so justice should not only should ha should treat people equally, and that's this that's what the scale is supposed to represent. So let's explore some of what we heard. What what is what is actually happening? So in Mecklenburg County, what you'll see is the blue bar represents those who are white, who uh, have a case filed against them. The red bar represents those who are black, who have a criminal case filed against them. And then the green is for Latinx folks who have cases filed against them. And you can see that people who are black disproportionately have a case filed against them. Now, I will say that the difference in the, the numbers here reflects a, a kind of a, an odd thing in Mecklenburg County that one defendant or one incident can result in multiple charges. So that's why there's so many more cases uh, you know, represented here than there are defendants. But you can see the significant difference between the number of, the number of people per 1,000 citizens of Mecklenburg County who are arrested, who are black versus those who are white. And we'll just keep it. Conspiracy to commit robbery. I'm going like, you can't get them on one, you're going to give them up stuff to hell. That's exactly right. Um, I think part of the theory is that the one incident might justify multiple charges, right? If I'm 17 and I'm with my friend walking down the street and we see a car sitting there unlocked and get the idea like let's break into the car and let's maybe oh let there's something in airpods let's take them you know well that's that could be conspiracy to commit breaking entering of a motor vehicle breaking entering of a motor vehicle misdemeanor larceny and so we'll charge everything uh -oh. I don't know we're just having all kinds of technical difficulties. That's okay, it's gonna fix it. It'll just take a second. Um, so what, yes, that's part of it, that if we, um, and it induces plea deals, right? If I'm facing four or five charges for the same incident, uh, pleading guilty to one of those charges, seems pretty appetizing compared to being found guilty on all of those charges. So it's also a tactic to induce um, or facilitate plea negotiations. And in just a second, I will have, although I might have to grab my phone because it gets there faster. Oh, good. Okay, this should not take very long and I do apologize. Okay, are we good? I hope we're back on. Are we back on? Okay, so now let's talk about what happens at arrest and booking. And this is really where both the intersection between the decision making of law enforcement and judicial officials shows up. So what you'll see here, this black bar kind of represents um, the experience of I feel like that's not displaying, right? I don't know why. Okay, so I'm gonna have to explain this um, slide to you because that's not displaying, right? Okay, so the first, this first graphic represents the population of Mecklenburg County. About 51% white, um, about 36% African-American, and then we've had the green bar, which is uh, Latin American. The second, oh, there we go, custodial arrest. So folks who are um, arrested 
by law enforcement. So compared to the general population, the representation of whites in the general population, they are far less likely to be arrested, right? And the red bar, black uh, citizens in Mecklenburg County are more likely to be arrested. Once arrested, white defendants are actually less likely to receive conditions that require them to be booked into the jail and not be able to be free awaiting trial, whereas African-Americans are more likely to be detained pretrial. Does this graph make sense? Okay. So it's also important to note that nationally, about and, and, and in Mecklenburg County, 60% of people who are sitting in our jail are awaiting trial. These are people who have not been found guilty of a crime. These are people who are waiting in a, a trial uh, and, and, a con, and uh, to be able to present their defense. Yep. Is that, that is correct. Yes, because actually in North Carolina, I'll just go ahead and take a little detour here. In North Carolina, uh, um, like many states, we actually don't have preventive detention for adults, meaning except in very limited circumstances like first degree murder or someone who commits a firearm felony after have being on pretrial release for a firearm felony or recently convicted of a firearm felony, people are entitled to conditions of release. In fact, the statute requires release on a promise to appear or some non-monetary condition unless there's some evidence that this person really is a danger. And then the condition is a secured bond, having to pay money to get out. So the vast majority of people who are in our jail are in our jail awaiting trial and unable to post their bond. A very small percentage are there on serious violent offenses um, on preventive detention. And to that point. Yeah, so the way that it works is, as far as the court's concerned, the, whole, uh, the, the total amount needs to be deposited with the clerk. But obviously, most people, especially folks, as we've seen, who've had, who've had uh, interactions with the justice system, don't have that kind of money laying around, don't even ha don't have $5,000, $2,500, $500 sitting around to post bond. Um, and so what happens is they reach out to a bondsman who has certain licensing and, and so forth. And the bondsman typically charges about um, 10 to 20 percent. So if I have a $50,000 bond, I have to pay the bondsman at least $5,000 to put up that $50,000, and I'm out that $5,000. I don't get that back. But as long as I show up for all of my court dates, the bondsman gets his $50,000 back from the court. Yes? Yes, so it is the responsibility of a judicial official. So first the magistrate, who is a judicial official, um, right after arrest, and then a district court judge like me within 24 hours. And in Mecklenburg County, we see folks the next day after their arrest. Um, they're not generally involved. They're more involved now at, at that first appearance within 24 hours of arrest. Um, and they present information to the court. We've made a lot of reforms, which are somewhat uh, evidenced in this slide, to try to make sure that people are not sitting in jail, that we're not really stressed out about being out in the community simply because they can't pay. So we've done a lot of work to try to make sure that money is not the thing that's holding people in custody. That if someone doesn't really pose a risk, we're not really stressed out about what they're gonna do in the community on release. We wanna let them out 
uh, on a written promise. We want to use, we have pretrial services in Mecklenburg County. We want to release them to pretrial services to help them keep up with court dates and not require money. But what you can see is despite our efforts to safely reduce the jail population, despite our efforts to reduce the use of money bond, a significant disparity continues to exist. We still see that African Americans are seven times more likely to be jailed uh, in Mecklenburg County than, than whites. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of options under the statute. We can, we can just release people on a written promise to appear. We can also require an unsecured bond, meaning if you miss your court date, you're going to have to pay. But otherwise, you don't have, you don't, you, you're free. And as long as you do what you're supposed to do, we, we're not going to have a problem. And then finally, a person can be released into the custody of someone else willing to supervise them. So that could be a parent, right, or uh, a, a family member. It can also be a pretrial services agency. So in Mecklenburg County, we have a pretrial services agency that is an entity of the Mecklenburg County government, um, and they provide um, multiple levels of supervision from, hey, we're just going to text you and make sure you remember your court dates, to I need you to call us once a week and check in, make sure you know we're on track, all the way up to you're suffering from serious and persistent mental illness. We're gonna stay in touch a couple times a week. We're gonna maybe connect you to a social worker or a case manager and try to help keep you, you know, on track until your court date. Um, it actually varies from federal district to federal district, but generally speaking, the federal courts do have preventive detention. So if there's someone you're, that's the thing that's kind of irrational about a bail system, right? And a, my perfect example of this, because it's, it's an, inter, an, an intersection with the criminal justice system we see a lot, is someone who commits violence against their partner. Right, a spouse who is physically abusive with their partner. That partner is not safer because that person was able to post a $25,000 bond, right? That person is no more safe. In fact, that actually might increase their risk because now not only has this person been arrested and charged and facing conviction in the justice system, which might make them pretty angry, to They've depleted the family's resources to secure release um, in a way that may put that victim in a more vulnerable situation than they were before the arrest. So the federal system does have preventive detention and allows judges to, you know, to use certain criteria based on evidence to just detain people who they really believe present a danger. Um, we, don't, we don't really have that in North Carolina. Okay, so I'm gonna, to your point and your point about what is it that predicts a person's, you know, bad outcomes in the justice system, the likelihood they're gonna be involved in the justice system, the likelihood that they're gonna get arrested, detained, so on and so forth. A really great um, study done by one of my Race Matters for Juvenile Justice colleagues, Dr. Susan McCarter, who is at UNC Charlotte. Um, oh, it's taking a minute. Okay, Dr. McCarter, conducted a study, a statewide analysis in Virginia. And she wanted to understand um, kind of what, what predicts, what factors are the strongest predictors that a juvenile in the juvenile justice system would be diverted, right? Just, just kind, of, kind of steered in a different direction and not referred to court uh, or uh, ultimately incarcerated. So she looked at kind of, okay, from, from being stopped maybe by a school resource officer in the community, the arrest, divert, detain, sent to court, ultimately to incarceration. What are the factors that predict these outcomes? Yes. In Virginia, it would be under 18. Well, in North Carolina, it's age six. 
Um, that's something you can do is advocate with your local uh, state delegation uh, to raise the minimum age of juvenile jurisdiction. So um, what are the things that ought to determine whether a kid gets arrested or an adult um, and uh, whether they end up being incarcerated? So obviously the legal factors that we think should influence that would be crime severity, right? Are we talking about stealing a soda from you know the Circle K or are we talking about robbing somebody at gunpoint? Um, and then prior history, have we been down this path before? Have we tried to help you learn from your mistakes? Have we tried to re rehabilitate you? So the two red are the legal factors and then the green represent the extra legal factors, right? Like family income, socioeconomic status, um, level of education or engagement in education, race, where they live, urban, suburban, rural, and family structure. So what do you all suppose was the greatest predictor of um, outcomes for youth? Okay. So for diversion, one variable significantly predicted diversion, and that was crime severity. Like, are we going to even get you involved in the court system at all? Right? So the, the, the more severe your crime, the less likely you are to be diverted. But for incarceration, um, race was the strongest predictor of incarceration. It was even stronger than the severity of the crime. It was even stronger than prior record. Race was the strongest prediction. And after that was education. So I think that's, 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 that's the, what we wanna really try to investigate and interrogate. So that's why we're gonna talk about brain science. I'm gonna to have to, um, I'm gonna really try to limit this discussion a little bit so that um, we, can, we can talk about some really interesting studies. So essentially our brains have shortcuts. Alec learned about them in uh, AP psychology. Uh, he loved talking about them. He likes to also outdo me on my understanding. I might invite him to give us some examples. But um, essentially, our brains have to process so much information that if we didn't have shortcuts, we'd probably just be catatonic. Um, so our brains use um, the amygdala, which are a little almond-shaped part of our brain that um, receive data. They receive the data, they send it to the prefrontal cortex, which is our executive decision-making part of our brain, the part of the brain that goes, okay, wait, what's going on here? What do I know? What should I do? What does this mean? But the, the amygdala are making some quick judgments and decisions about the information. And sometimes those um, decisions will, that, that processing, that rapid processing of the amygdala will guide our our, uh, our reactions or our responses while the prefrontal cortex is still trying to process it. So obviously this is important because as, okay, humans, oh, it's taking a minute for these slides to pop up there, right? We need that because we live in a world where we have to be able to not be like, oh, wait, what's going on here? Oh, and furry thing, gosh, she's like 10 feet tall. Whoa, those are some sharp teeth. You know, we can't wait for our brains to do all that. So the amygdala is like, oh my gosh, get out of here, right? Before there's like this whole prefrontal cortex getting involved. Um, so just go ahead and indulge me. Um, any volunteers in trying to read this passage? No? Okay. Well, let's follow along. Can I have a volunteer for the next passage? I promise it's gonna be a little easier. <laughs> okay, here we go. 
Hold on, it seems to be a little bit of a lag. Okay, here we go. Can you try to read that out loud? Anyone want to read it out loud? Okay. <laughs> According to research at that university, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be in the right place. The reset can be a never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can be a total mess. Right without it being a problem because the human mind doesn't actually read every single letter by itself but the word as a whole. That's a mental shortcut that our brains use in order to process information, right? And we need them because what, um, without them, like I said, we would really struggle to function. Um, although we'd like to think that everything we do, every decision we make, every opinion we form is rational and thoughtful and considered, it just can't be. Because rational thinking is so computationally demanding and slow that um, we wouldn't be able to process the information. Scientists estimate that the subconscious brain is processing, processing speed is about 500,000 times faster than conscious thinking and reaches a speed of about 20 million bits per second versus conscious processing. So 20 million versus 40 bits per second. <laughs> I read a lot about this sort of thing and I would like to see some of these studies when officers are engaged with anybody mm -hmm. and something happens that gives them a death or something serious. I'd like to know, was this That's really insightful because I don't have it in this what present. Hundred percent, like because because fatigue affects our ability to stop, our ability to stop and process what's going on. And I don't have it in this presentation, but there's a really great study that was done with Israeli judges who do who review uh, cases uh, for parole, and what the study found was that the judges took more time, considered more information, and made more parole release decisions early in the morning. And the hearings became shorter as we got closer to lunch. There were fewer releases as we got closer to lunch. Then they had lunch. They came back for the afternoon. They spent more time taking evidence, more release decisions at the beginning you know, of the, of the, of the session. And then again, tapered off, shortened as the session went on. Because it's, it's tiring to stop and slow down and really thoughtfully consider all the information. In fact, in court, one of the strategies we've used to try to address that uh, and reduce, you know, really address some of this uh, cognitive fatigue is to do really complex, hard cases first thing in the morning and do the cases that are more rote, that, are, that don't require a lot of evidence, don't require a lot of, frankly, judgment call uh, later in the session. So there are several different types of heuristics. I'm, I think I'll skip a few just for, for the sake of time, but um, we have, I, uh, I'm just waiting for it to populate, but we have um, five that I included, confirmation, uh, availability, representativeness, categorizing and generalizing in the just world. So these, as I said, these heuristics, they're mental shortcuts. They're shortcuts that our brains are just designed to use in order to make sense of information as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, so confirmation heuristic is the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of an existing set of beliefs or theories. Anybody have an example? Alec, you want to, or you have one? Go ahead, Alec. So for those on Zoom, what Alec 
shared is that if you're someone who believes that the earth is flat and you were to go search up on Google, you know, ev looking for evidence about a, a flat world, you might discount the evidence of a round world and really focus and select the evidence of a flat world. Yes. Yes, vaccination decisions. Um, and honestly, I will tell you as a judge, I've seen this a lot in um, in uh, impaired driving cases. Uh, when I, you know, today, um, almost every interaction with the police officer is recorded. Um, used to be through the motor vehicle cameras, we get the VHS tape and put them into the VCR. Now it's the body worn cameras that's digitally exchanged. But I will hear an officer testify, not all the time, but especially those officers that are, what they do every day is DWI cases. I'll hear them testify about a defendant's conduct and demeanor about their swaying and their slurred speech. And then the video is played and I'm not seeing it. But, and I think that's confirmation bias that they are kind of focusing in on information that, that corroborates their existing belief that this is an impaired driving case. Okay. Um, the availability heuristic is essentially um, a shortcut that relies on information that's just readily available to us in order to um, understand a, a problem or uh, information. So for example, um, a, a really good example of this is frankly nightly coverage of crime. A study uh, in New York City looked at the number of um, broadcasts about crime involving Black defendants versus the number of stories and broadcasts about crime involving white defendants and found that there were, despite the, that essentially there was a disparity between the actual percentage of crimes committed by Black defendants versus the coverage. There, so essentially, um, whereas at the time of this study, African Americans were responsible for about 54% um, of murders, thefts, and assaults, um, the coverage was uh, for 74% uh, of the coverage was for co crimes committed by African Americans. Um, not only if, if that's the information we're fed all the time, then we then that influences how we might think about a situation when we hear, you know, if you're fed all the time on the news, oh, oh, these black kids, these you know, black adults committing these offenses, then even when you just hear, oh, did you hear so and so's car was broken into or around the block? The mind might automatically go to it's probably, you know, like an, an image even before even before it's a conscious thought. Does, Drunk, I mean, you, you right? Exit pre-existing ideas, exactly, and that's the availability heuristic. Um, the representativeness uh, heuristic is essentially um, kind of when we see someone who meets our prototype for a particular type of person, then we might attribute all kinds of attributes to that person, right? Um, so. Well, I'll use my, my niece, my daughter, my niece daughter as an example. She came to live with my husband and I when she was 14. And, um, and if you looked at her, <laughs> she had piercings all over her face and ears, uh, different color hair, you know, kind of got like her dock boots and gothy uh, clothes. And what kinds of traits might you attribute to her when you saw her, right? maybe rebellious, maybe even promiscuous, maybe not that serious about school. Um, but that she was none of those things. Um, but that's the availability, the representativeness heuristic. Categorizing and generalizing, you know, how we sort of sort people uh, based on their similarities. 
Uh, and then there's the just world heuristic. I think it's worth taking a minute to talk about this one um, because I think it explains a lot about how we um, how we make sense of things, right? If it's really hard to accept when something really random and bad happens, right? Like the death of a loved one, even, or someone you care about getting a cancer diagnosis. I remember when my dad died, um, I was, it was, gosh, how many years ago was it? 20, almost 20 years ago. He was in a car accident. It was just this sudden, horrible, horrible loss. It's hard to make sense of. And honestly, my brain was already going to, well, you know, he was a bad driver. It's kind of a miracle, in you know, like making sense of it, right? Um, well, he was coming to peace about his struggles in his faith and his struggles with his chosen community of faith. And maybe he had gotten to that place of peace and resolution. It was, it was his time, right? Those are the things we do to make sense of random, inexplicable things. This heuristic is also why we have certain statutes that protect victims of sexual assault. Right, because when a woman is uh, a victim and accusing someone of sexual assault or rape, uh, one of the things that we saw in trials was when the woman would talk about or testify about the encounter with her assailant, well, I met him in a bar, right? He bought me a few drinks. What were you wearing? A dress, short skirt, high heels. Um, we were having a good time. He invited me back to his place. And as you hear that testimony, what do we do? Well, I wouldn't have had that many drinks. I wouldn't have worn that outfit. Well, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have accepted his invitation to go back to his place, right? It's a way of making sense of something random and horrible um, to put us, because that dissonance, right? That something random and horrible can happen between this belief that we have that we live in a world where good people, you know, are treated well and have fair outcomes. And the people that, you know, only bad things happen to bad people, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, but it's to make sense of it, right? Because, well, I wouldn't have ever been in that situation because I never would have made those choices. Yes, Alan. Yes, exactly, the just world. But we know that that's not true. Bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people. Um, but this is a shortcut we use to, to try to make sense of it all. I am, I think I'm gonna show you guys this. It doesn't take very long. Um, has anybody seen this? Well, these two have, but that's okay. All right, so it's, I'm just gonna play it and you'll follow the instructions and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, okay, well, I did queue it up on my, I, should I just go to where I had it open? Cause I was trying to, hold on. Oh, okay. I was trying to con I was trying to be fancy and control click it. Oh. Do I turn this on? Okay, wait, I'm gonna skip the ad. Okay. The monkey business illusion. Oh, Count how many times the player's wearing white. <laughs> I'm not paying attention to the questions. I should have had somebody. Okay. Okay. Oh man, but see the. Sorry. Pass the ball. Okay. So count how many, did you see the instructions? Okay. Well, this is going to make it easy. <laughs> 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 
Darn it. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it, but did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. <laughs> when you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. <laughs> and that's the monkey business illusion. Can you help me make sure I get it? Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at the invisible gorilla dot sharing this. Now we share. Okay. Okay. Let's share. So that's just kind of a fun, right, little exercise in looking at an illustrating heuristics. When we're looking for certain things, we miss a lot of other, other information. So let's talk about the science of bias. <laughs> that I cannot tell. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm kind of, I'm just pleased that some of y'all missed it because it was really slow so I'm glad that it was, that it was missed by some of you. So biases are heuristics. They're just mental shortcuts. They are mental shortcuts that are influenced by, informed by our experiences in the world we live in, but they're just heuristics. And they are totally normal. And they are part of how our brains operate in order to navigate the information that we encounter in the world. So we're not talking about explicit bias. In fact, lots of uh, survey studies and research show that, you know, really since the 1950s and particularly in the last 30 years, very few people and very few white people endorse explicitly biased or racist views. And that's really important because when we're talking about those outcomes that we were looking at before, we're not talking about bigots. We're not talking about people who are holding negative, inhumane, racist views. We're talking about something, frankly, much more subversive um, because it is something that is happening below our conscious awareness, but having devastating effects. Uh, the National Center for State Courts. Okay, so unconscious bias. Um, these are attitudes or stereotypes. Uh, they're subconscious. These are associations, right? They're associations that our minds make between different types of information and can affect our feelings, our attitudes, and our reactions um, based on those associations, based on appearances or characteristics of others. These associations develop over the course of a lifetime through our exposure to direct and indirect messages. So I'm gonna share with you that, um, that uh, about 10 years ago when I started in this race equity work in the court system, I uh, accepted the invitation, frankly, reluctantly, privately, um, to take an implicit association test. Harvard University has um, a link, you can just, Harvard 
IAT, Implicit Association Test. And you can take these tests uh, to learn about your associations in a number of different ways. There are association tests, not just for race and gender, but also for obesity, for age, for disability. Um, I can't remember all, there are lots of them. So when I first took this implicit association test, as I said, reluctantly, frankly, fearfully, <laughs> like, what am I gonna learn about myself that I don't wanna know, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, I, I did the one on race and um, the test indicated that I had a slight preference for whites. That's how the, the results come out. Um, it's essentially, it's, it's a, you kind of see an idea of how this works when I get into a study uh, on this. But um, one of the things that I think is really important is you can change these attitudes. You can change these associations. You can change how your brain processes the information. And you can actually change the outcome on that test, I know, because 10 years later, I took it. <laughs> After really intentional work, uh, really intentional interrogation of my own biases, intentional use of tools and strategies to change my uh, attitudes and my thinking, and um, my results had changed significantly because of the work that I had done. And there's re there, there are studies that show that people who, the first step, right, like, like, like um, AA and NA is just hey, admitting, hey, we all have biases, I have biases. Now, if I can just, you know, really interrogate them, understand them, and get intentional about doing some things that challenge those associations and those uh, beliefs, then maybe I can, um, I can, I can change those, those biases or eliminate them. So, they are unconscious and automatic, pervasive. They don't always align with our explicit. I mean, I would have never said, like, I have a preference for white people or, uh, I guess, an, the opposite, uh, a, a dislike or something of people of color. But they, they're they shaped by our experiences and information, you know, that we receive over time. And, um, and they have real, real world effects on our behavior. But the, like I said, they're malleable. I am thinking I'm going to skip the bicycle thief. It's a great video. Um, if you all have seen uh, the show, what would you do? Have you all seen that show? Okay, so basically in the video, I think it was done in the 90s, they take footage of uh, three different individuals trying to break a bike free from a lock. And the first video is a white guy and he's trying to break, you know, get the chain off, break the lock. Um, and he's, at first he's tinkering with it, he's yanking on the bike and people are, it's in a park and people are just walking by like, what's that guy doing? You know, they just keep walking by and then he like gets out, you know, like what, like the big, whatever you call it, uh, cutters trying to cut it and people are like, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm just trying to get this bike. I'm like, okay. Um, then they show a black guy wearing the same outfit, same age, doing the same thing. And like literally the first person who passes by is like, what are you doing? Is that your bike? You know, the thir third person, whose bike is that? That's not yours, is it? The fourth person, I'm calling the police and the police come out. Now it's a little bit funny that when they have a white woman doing the same thing, <laughs> walk by and <laughs> one of the men says, can I help you with that? <laughs> so, right, that's a bias too. Um, so it's, it's a great video that just sort of um, illuminates that. Uh, this is kind of a lot, but essentially the reason this is important is because when individuals who are making decisions in a system are making those decisions without awareness of bias, without awareness of how their own beliefs and attitudes affect their decision making, it can cause an entire system to have to be um, impacted. It creates this phenomenon described by the Haas Institute as structural racial, racialization. So um, it's important for us to examine this uh, as part of efforts to address 
uh, an equitable and disproportionate result. So I like to talk about research. Alec knows that I have a major girl crush on Jennifer Eberhardt, who is a researcher at um, Stanford. She's a winner of a MacArthur Genius Award. She's this amazing study that gets to uh, some of what I think we were we were talking about earlier. So what she did is she um, had three groups of, of uh, Stanford and Berkeley students as her study participants. She sat them all in front of computers, like in a little booth, and showed them long line drawings like the gun that you see here. And um, there were two types of images, crime relevant images like gun, knife, handcuffs, and then crime irrelevant images like a stapler, bugle, cup and saucer. And then what she did is she had collected photographs of black and of white Stanford faculty and students. And she divided the study participants into two groups. One group would just look at these images gradually appear on the screen and have to identify them as soon as they could recognize what it was. The second group and the third group were primed with a subli subliminally. So a photo of either for group uh, uh, to a, a white student or faculty member would flash so quickly they weren't even aware they were seeing it. And then for group three, a photo of a black student or faculty member would flash so quickly they weren't even aware that they were seeing it before the image starts to appear. And then she would have, she had them uh, press the space bar as soon as they could figure out what the object was. Does this make sense so far? Okay. So, Let's see what happens. So when the, the students um, are presented the object, um, the objects are gradually appearing over up to 41 frames. They're able to figure out what it is within 23 to 24 frames, okay? For the crime irrelevant objects, the cup, the saucer, the stapler. So when the um, when they are presented with the crime relevant objects, right? Same. Without the prime, they identify the cup and the saucer at the same rate they do the handcuffs. So then, when they are primed with images of white students and faculty, look at how much longer it takes for those participants to recognize crime relevant objects. What do you think happened to those who received the, the prime of the black faces? They were able to recognize those crime relevant objects pretty quickly. So what this study shows is that white primes, I mean, I think this is kind of interesting. I mean. I, I think you maybe expect it, right? That seeing that subliminal unconscious uh, image of a black student or faculty member might accelerate the identification of crime relevant objects. It's kind of interesting that the exposure to white primes actually slowed down the identification of crime relevant objects. And it all happened beneath, you know, any kind of conscious awareness. So how does this play out for us in the, in the, in the legal system? Um, so Frank Bumgardner, who is a professor at uh, UNC, um, did a study that was actually published um, in the New York Times several years ago. What he did is he looked at um, kind of, you know, what's happening in, uh, cities really across the country, but he, but North Carolina was one of the states and Charlotte, one of the cities that he studied when it comes to um, being stopped by law enforcement as a driver. So um, what he found might not surprise you. Uh, black males were way more likely to be stopped than white males. Uh, black females more likely than white females. I'm Guessing based on our discussion so far, that doesn't surprise everyone. 
Um, he examined 13,233,000 law enforcement traffic stops throughout the state of North Carolina. Um, and essentially what he found is that even though African-Americans make up for only 22% of the entire state population, they were about 40% more likely to be stopped, not for things that maybe you would say, well, I mean, what can you do, right? Like maybe even speeding, right? Or reckless driving. They were more likely to be pulled over for vehicle regulatory issues, like, oh, your tail lights out or your your plate's not properly displayed. They were more likely to be stopped for equipment issues or other vehicle. These are situations of discretion where I don't have to pull you over. Um, one of the things that I thought, like I said, maybe that's not surprising. Um, one of the things that Frank Bumbuck Gardner did with this data set is he essentially eliminated the bad apples. He kind of said, well, let's take the officers who have a high number of disproportionate stops and arrests. Let's just take them out of it. They've got a high number of stopping black drivers. We're, we're going to assume that they're kind of like our bad apples, that they're, they just have, they have a problem. We're taking them out of the data set. It didn't change a thing. So this is something that's happening. Good people, you know, people who are that's the point of this is it's it's below our conscious awareness it operates without our understanding without identifying it. no so um the other thing that i think is interesting is who gets searched right so broken tail lady pull you over who gets searched um here we are we're charlotte black drivers were three and a half times more likely to be searched or th almost three times more likely to be searched. But what's interesting to me is who had contraband, right? Um, the chance that uh, black drivers had contraband was lower than the chance that white drivers had contraband. Right, and it also gets to this role of You do not, well, no, you don't. Correct. If they have, if they have probable cause or reasonable suspicion, they're two different standards. But what constitutes reasonable suspicion? What constitutes probable cause? Right? Um, how do you articulate the justification? The Supreme Court has upheld certain factors like the neighborhood that you're in. Oh, it's a high crime neighborhood. So that could be a factor that makes a justification to search this driver uh, legal, right? Stand up to constitutional muster. Well, I'm probably not gonna be driving in that neighborhood a whole lot. So that factor isn't gonna help me. Mm -hmm. National Convention. I was on Park Road in a 91 white Buick, older white woman, very old white car, but my little tag on the back had not been changed. Uh -huh. And I was pulled over. Uh -huh. And two women officers immediately flashed my uh -huh. And I was pulled. What brought that about? And I think. Well, I think that that's probably not wrong, 
right? That um, what's going on in an area uh, uh, where officers are patrolling influences, I guess it's sort of like that, um, the, uh, the uh, Alec, help me, the availability and the um, representativeness heuristic, right? Um, while I'm in this community or this neighborhood or this part of town, uh, this is the kind of thing that happens here. Oh, here I have this person that I'm stopping. Well, they're probably going to have drugs or a gun or whatever. But what the study found is that actually African Americans were less likely to have contraband once they were searched. Yes. Um, I'm sure that could play a role in it too, right? Um, so blacks were uh, also still, even though they were less likely than whites to be found with contraband, they were still twice as likely to be arrested. All right, so what's going on there? Because it's some of that discretion. So several years ago, when we started working on uh, trying to address issues of race inequity in the criminal justice system. One of the first questions that we asked was, well, like, what are the top charges that cause people to get arrested and booked into our jail? I will confess, I was a little surprised. It's impaired driving, misdemeanor larceny, possession of drug paraphernalia, you know, like a blunt, a crack pipe, or a baggie. Um, assault on a female, which is a domestic violence charge, simple assault, resisting an officer, second degree trespass, and possession of marijuana. So that, those are the main things that cause people to get arrested and booked into our jail. But look at the disparities. The blue indicates um, white defendant versus black defendant, right? The relative rates. And what's interesting here is for larceny, for possession of drug paraphernalia, resisting an officer, possession of marijuana, huge, huge disparities. Black folks are 10 times more likely to be booked into our jail for possession of marijuana, um, eight times more likely to be booked into our jail for talking back to or resisting uh, a police officer. One charge for which there's no disparity whatsoever and it's driving while impaired. And I really sat with that data when we first looked at it. It's like, oh, well, what's going on there? And I think I have an answer. It's the role of discretion. Impaired driving has been so litigated, mostly by white folks, in our state appellate and Supreme Court, and even in the United States Supreme Court, that the criteria, the legal justification to pull someone over on the suspicion of impaired driving is so objective and so limited and specific that it reduces the influence of discretion. The justification for after I pull you over and I investigate you for impaired driving, for actually placing you under arrest and charging you with impaired driving is so objective and so specific that there's very little room for discretion. And discretion is where bias lives. And the law, right? They're trained. Like, uh, leaving inside the lane is not enough. They have to go over the line. They really need to go over the line more than once. Like, you know, bad driving is defined as so specifically that it's, it's not subjective. And that reduces the influence of unconscious, unaware biases in the investigative process. Um, let's talk about the jury. So when we think about the judicial system, we think about judges, lawyers, probation officers, but jurors are an essential part of the criminal justice system. Jurors are the citizens of our community, right? So this was an interesting study. Um, looking at the interracial aspect of cases with a black defendant and a white victim, what the study found is that these interracial aspects make race especially salient when it comes to imposing the death sentence. So I'm going to try to take a minute to explain this because it, I, um, okay, so essentially the researchers started with the premise, okay, that some defendants have more characteristically black features, darker skin, wider nose, bigger mouth, um, and some defendants have less characteristically black features, like light skin. 
Um, and so what they did is they looked at what is the death sentence decision of jurors when the defendant is black and the victim is black. So that's what this graph is, right? We have a black victim and a black defendant. Defendants who appear less stereotypically black orange or more stereotypically black red got the same treatment. But then when we get to the black defendant, and so, and what the researchers kind of concluded is that intra-racial crimes that seem to be viewed as in, more like more of interpersonal conflict largely. But when we have a black defendant and a white victim, the characteristically black defendant is more than twice as likely to receive the death sentence. So it appears that race uh, plays a role in determining the blame murdering, the degree of malice of the crime. In jury selection, this plays out too. So um, this uh, slide is going to refer to a study uh, about bias in jury selection. So I don't know how, how much do y'all know about jury. People kind of think of it as picking jurors, really picking people off. Um, and so what this study found essentially is that when um, it's a complicated study, but essentially what they did is they had two jurors presented to uh, law students, judges, and lawyers, and participants were offered two jury profiles. Juror number one was 43 years old, married, male with no jury experience, a journalist who had written articles about police misconduct several years earlier. Juror number two was 40, divorced, uh, had been on a jury before and had uh, expressed skepticism about statistics because they're easily manipulated. So essentially what this study found is when juror number one was black, juror number one's articles about police misconduct were used as a justification to excuse him from the jury much more often than when juror number one was white. And when juror number two was black, participants were twice as likely to use the skepticism about statistics to justify removing him from the jury compared to when he was white. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we talked about the role of discretion because we're short on time. What, I, I say, what I'll say about this study, I love this study, the Breaking School Rules study was done in Texas. These researchers um, looked at, um, they looked at 1 million students over the course of several years. Mm -hmm. They looked at students in schools in urban, suburban, and rural parts of Texas. They controlled for 83 variables to try to look at what predicts the likelihood that a kid gets suspended or receive discipline in school. And essentially what they were able to find is that if you took a white kid and a black kid who are in the same zip code, whose parents have the same income, have the same family structure, you know, have the same educational background, everything the same, that black kid is more likely to receive disciplinary action for the same very thing as the white kid. That race was predictive of their experience. And what was really interesting about this study is that in 3% of the offense types, which are called mandatorily reported offenses, offenses that don't involve discretion about what should I do, right? Like having a weapon at school or having drugs at school, um, there was no discretion. But for those 97% of school violations, where it's, well, what is the three step? What's in subordination? That's where the disparities existed. Even things like public display of affection. So I want to talk about that. Um, again, in, in the legal system, a, a study looked at, uh, presented uh, partners in 22 law firms with legal memorandums to rate 
uh, to kind of grade the, the quality of the memorandum. And essentially, when they were uh, the, 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 when they were told that the associate director memo was black, they found more errors in the memorandum than when they were, it was the same memo, than the departments who were told that the student was black. Um, okay. I think that's very much in for exactly what we're trying to do about it. Because I kind of felt like spending more time on kind of what's going on here and what are the problems and the issues. Um, so we definitely welcome any questions that you have. I'd like to go back to your uh, sort of an early slide that your uh, colleague at USC Charlotte was at uh, McCarter, uh -huh. uh, Professor McCarter. There were various aspects of uh, contributing to uh, involvement, uh, escalating involvement in the mm -hmm. judicial system. Uh, sex was not met. Sex was not mentioned there, and maybe she didn't study it. Um, I'm just. I have an assumption that probably more males are involved than uh, so. girls. That's Am I accurate. Right? Yeah. Although uh, um, over the last. 10 years, we've seen a lot more specifically Black females um, uh, in, involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, I, it's, it's typically been way, I mean, it still is over, over uh, disproportionately male, but we are seeing an increase um, in Black females. So tell me what the solution to all this. <laughs> so we have to work hard. Yeah, I mean, so there are several things. I'll tell you a little bit about some things that we're doing that we've identified that we think are some some things we can do, right? Because we can't we can deal with ourselves. So, and that's something someone said to me years ago, right? Because when you look out in the world and you look at okay, well, but poverty is racial. And poverty plays a role in, you know, risk of criminal justice involvement and violence. I can't fix poverty. I can't fix homelessness. I can't fix, right? But I can fix me um, in my system. And especially now as the chief district court judge responsible for all of the administrative aspects of the district court in Nicola County, there are things we can do. So it's one of the things we're doing. Um, I've worked with law enforcement, the county, the district attorney, the public defender, and probation to create um, a race equity uh, curriculum for justice system practitioners uh, to educate them, on, not just on you know, unconscious bias, but also on specific strategies that they can employ to address their biases, to mitigate the influence of their biases. Um, we have implemented structured decision-making tools uh, to your point, sir, judges make the decision, right? Does the person have to pay money or are they in or out? Um, and so we've done a lot of work to train judges and magistrates, not just on unconscious bias, but also to equip, and also, but also on the harm of um, detention for people who don't pose a risk. And we've equipped uh, judicial officers with structured decision-making tools to help them focus on objective criteria about risk and flight and not things like they live with his mama or finished the eighth grade, you know, whatever, but to focus on those objective criteria that research shows are predictive of risk of committing another crime or flight. Um, yeah, we're doing a lot of stuff. Um, we have done, so we're doing some work in child welfare to do what we call blind reviews. This was a practice that was implemented in a county in Florida uh, and, and the district attorney's office has done this for making decisions about plea offers and sentencing recommendations, taking this case, removing all indicators of race, and then sitting down at a round table and discussing the objective facts, and then making uh, team decisions about what, whether a child welfare petition should be filed, uh, seeking custody of the child or children, or in the prosecutor's case, whether uh, what plea deal will offer, whether to pursue charges and what sentencing uh, recommendations. Right? Um, I know there are others, but I, so those are some things we can do. I think, you know, um, in Durham County, a police chief actually uh, saw a 
huge reduction in disparity for our searches and arrests when we implemented a policy that officers advise every defendant of their right to uh, refuse to be searched and ask them to give a written consent to search. Mm -hmm. um, that, that forced the officers to search really when they find probable cause. Um, and, uh, and it helps to reduce disparity. So the, the things that we can do individually and institutionally to reduce this issue. Um, probably wrong, but I think knowing people that aren't just like you, yeah. it breaks down all those heuristics. So if you know somebody that's black or, or richer than you, any you need a different thing, something different than you, it's less likely to categorize them as other. Yeah. So I wasn't really going to get into this, but there are some things we can do, and Eric's right. We can take an implicit search, and I mean, it's hard. I, I, I told you, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I don't want to know. They're but, fast. They don't, they don't take long time. It takes like, I don't know, less than 10 minutes, probably. Three minutes. But just confronting it. Like, okay, let me just see what it is and deal with it. And start to ask myself, why am I doing what I'm, what I'm doing? Why, do I, why am I making this conclusion about this person or this situation that I'm making? Um, practicing individuation, trying to really try to ask yourself, what do I really know about this person? Um, how do I how do I, I get to understand their characteristics and attributes aside from maybe a generalization about an other group that I might not have a lot of exposure to? Um, and like Eric said, um, employing counter stereotypes and increasing your intergroup content. So, I mean, honestly, it sounds kind of silly, but reading books uh, by Black authors about Black families and Black communities can help as a deep eye-opening solution. Watching programs about Black families and Black communities can help as a deep eye-opening strategy. Obviously, having intentional interactions with people who are in your outgroup um, are deep eye-opening strategies. They help, they help us when we find ourselves in a situation with someone in our outgroup that we don't really know to, to not, for those assumptions to not arise or those, those um, generalizations to not arise. So those are, um, and, and, and another one is perspective taking. And this is something I do a lot as a judge, right? Like, wait, let me put myself in this person's shoes. Let me try to, Put myself in their situation and their, the experiences that they just described and how they ended up where they are and try to understand it from, from their perspective, which helps me not only to have empathy, but to really connect with their humanity and probably um, make a decision that um, is individualized. We do have a question from online. Okay. Um, is there racial bias in the plea bargain system? Yes. Yes. Even our own data shows that um, people of color are more likely to receive offers for an active sentence or to plead to more charges. That's all we got from online. Mm -hmm. I want to be respectful of your time. I think you're okay. Um, one other thing I would ask you to share, you had a couple of resources that you sent me in an email. If you want to either pull them up or just if you want to make oh, a yeah, couple of recommendations, yeah. whatever might be easier for you. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, I could put them in the chat, maybe. That would work where I can mm -hmm. just email them to me and I'll send it out to everyone else. Yeah, I can send it out to everybody in this room. Mm -hmm. and yeah. From the recording, we'll have a list. Let me get. Yeah, some of the associations kind of seven page away from Carmel and it's really interesting. And I guess, like you said, it's also all kinds of things like race, gender, uh, weight, it's all kind of uh, disability. disability. It's really fascinating. Um, and it's, 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 I don't know what it's worth. It's a, there's a link to the Inspector Association test. Yeah, 
Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, so let's try to put it in the chat before we start. Again. So there are a lot of links there that go to um, go to implicit.harvard.edu slash the implicit association class. Another one that's great for, for some of those strategies of increasing uh, group contact, uh, practicing individuation and counter stereotyping is to do the American Bar Association has broadly published and we've you know, just widely available a 21 day race equity and inclusion challenge mm -hmm. those daily one hour exercises. Well, I know that online there have been a few technical difficulties, and unfortunately, no, it's not your fault. Um, so our apologies to our friends online, but we all deeply appreciate you being here and helping us. Yep. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you.